Welcome to the Performance Health Podcast. My name is Tim Karen. Sorry, this one's been a little delayed. Uh, so we're finally getting around to our interview with the strength coach, Contraction Types. Today we have on Alan Bishop, Houston men's basketball strength conditioning coach. Alan and I actually go pretty far back. We did a Paula Quinn internship back at Utah State in 2014-ish, 2015. Um, either way, Alan and I know each other pretty long time now. Uh, I'm super fired up to have him on. Uh, he's just gave a ton of great insights in regards to contractions and how he's utilizing various methods within his setting with the men's basketball program at Houston. So really excited to have him on. Um, this one is a just absolute like gold mine full of tons of nuggets to pull out. Uh, you guys are going to love it. Before we get into that, Strength Deficit, the book is available for pre-order. You can save $10 off the Amazon price. As well as through July, we're going to have a pre-order special where you get a copy of the training programs with every order. And that pro that will run through July. Once it's available for actual no more pre-order, actual order, uh, those training programs will no longer be included, but they actually are in the book. You just will have a copy of the PDF for yourself. Also to realize.me, your command center for all health and performance data. This is a tool that I use, my staff uses. Biggest problem I constantly ran into is where do I have a place to store all of my data from all of my bald four stack Nord board dynamo grip strength, looking at all my nutrition, my supplements, my wellness, my RPE, even something like continuous glucose monitor. Where do I store all this stuff? My aura, my whoop, my everything that I'm trying to track in a given day, week, month. It was all siloed off and in tons of different spots. And it was hard to really actually triangulate that information to something useful. Now I have all that stuff sorted and it's seamlessly integrated to this platform. And I can use that to create experiments. So if I wanted to lose weight, what's the impact of supplemental forms of carnitine and body fat loss? Or if I want to improve my force, my force output on the force plate, what is the impact of doing this specific protocol of eccentric focused methods or concentric focused methods on this impact? Not only that, for members, you actually get discounts on blood panels and various supplements from the highest quality brands in the industry. This is a huge asset for all of our members here. Go over to realize.me to become a, uh, get on the pre-order for their, or get on the wait list for their actual platform. I can guarantee you, you will not regret it. It is a huge tool that I use, my staff uses, and we're all just enamored with it. It's a phenomenal asset for you as a user. And I look forward to hearing everyone tell me how great it is because it is great. All right. Thank you guys. Appreciate you guys. You're going to really love this episode with Alan. Without further ado, Alan Bishop. All right, everybody. We got Alan Bishop. Alan and I go actually pretty far back now. Uh, me and Alan crossed fast when we went to go see him at Utah State with uh, Uncle Chuck uh, and going through a week-long internship, which was just worth its weight in gold with a ton of great uh, one-liners, insights, and uh, and impractical tools. Like I'm kinetic, uh, kinetic linking and Gua Sha certified. I don't think I've used it since, but it's nice to say that I learned it directly from Charles. Um, and that's my take. I can't do anything with it, but either way, I'm glad I learned it. And I'm glad we had uh, Charles's uh, just wisdom and uh, insight. And uh, since then, Alan's gone on to couple, uh, one other spot from there, but um, Alan, I'll let you take the floor here, go through where you're working, what your role is, and uh, and any uh, things anyone any anyone who's listening might want to know about you. Yeah, so uh, you know, nothing too exciting about me. Like we've talked about in the past, we're all kind of boring and unexciting people. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I got a dose of reality uh, when I got done playing ball that I was very, very mediocre at best. I think the greatest compliment I ever got about my collegiate career was, you know, he was a pretty mediocre player and. I was impressed that they thought I was mediocre. <laughs> you know, I didn't think I was that good. Uh, but anyways, yeah, got into it straight away. Uh, went to a really small school called Southern Utah University. Uh, speaking to that Poliquin seminar, you know, kind of way back when, uh, where I met Will Greenberg, who, you know, kind of the, you know, the, the degrees of separation in coaching. Um, you know, a few years later, you know, was able to, you know, kind of watch him thrive as he took over the head coaching job at Southern Utah, uh, which was kind of a cool, you know, thing to watch from afar, but uh, went down to Southern Utah, was a grad assistant, got into an assistant role, uh, moved out to Texas, to University of Texas, Arlington, uh, where I was in a basketball role, uh, had an opportunity to go back to Utah State, where it was, you know, everybody under one umbrella, 
uh, Mountain West School. And then as the department evolved and grew and, you know, big, big shout out to Dave Schultz there. I mean, you talk about a guy that just did everything the right way with growing a department. Um, you know, we separated that out to, a, you know, he was a director role. I was a director of Olympic sports role, uh, you know, rolled out for, for a short time and then had the opportunity to present itself at University of Houston, where I am now, I'm going into season six, and, you know, it's a really, you know, good deal. It's, you know, it's kind of that old coaching cliche, the longer you do this, and, you know, hopefully the better you get, uh, you, you kind of end up working with a lot less people. So yeah. I got 13 scholarship athletes, and we uh, we were rocking and rolling. Yeah. Um, so we really want to discuss contraction types today, but um, I, I think the point of that is going to be hopefully screaming off the, the podcast here, but uh, you talked about some of the stops you had in there. And I, th I think this is a really important question. <laughs> At what point did you kind of zero in on, Hey, I want to work with basketball because your background, you played football. So, you know, yeah. was there a point like, of like, Hey, I really want to work with basketball. Yeah, it's, it started at Southern Utah. And when I took that job again, I, I think I'm 20, two, maybe 23, uh, grad assistant. And I went into it with a mindset, uh, you know, just, I, I was extremely sure of myself, even though I, I should not have been, you know, uh, but I was like, you know what, I, I think within three to five years, I'm going to be a division one head football strength coach. Like I, I'm, I got this, I'm ready for it. Like, I know what I want to do. I uh, just went with a lot of confidence that was not earned. Right. And so what within that uh, department though, there was the director and then there was myself and that was it. And so essentially when he would go out to football practice, I would be in the weight room. And we had a weight room that uh, I want to say when I got there, it had eight racks and platforms and it had a half a set of dumbbells. I mean, it wasn't even a full set. It was a, you know, very minimalist setup just due to space, finances, resources, et cetera. So realistically, you, you could have one team in there at a time. And so we had teams starting at, you know, 5.15 a.m. with baseball and, you know, track and field is rolling in starting at 6.15 at night. And we're just kind of rocking and rolling all day long. And so one of the fun things is before I got there, there had never been a full-time assistant. It was just one head guy rocking and rolling, uh, which obviously there's time demands that you can't meet with all the teams you work with. So when I got there, the basketball team, they wanted to train while football was out of practice. I was available. And it was kind of a two-part deal. Number one, you know, it was just fun, you know, working with that group. Uh, I really enjoyed working with that crew that we had. Uh, we had a handful of Australians on that team. Those are some, <laughs> those are some funny dudes. Uh, you know, so it was just enjoyable to be around them. Uh, you know, and, and they were very appreciative of somebody, you know, that wanted to work with them. Uh, but I'd say number two, we'd go through training and, and make no mistake about it, man. These are not genetic freaks, genetic anomalies like you see maybe a little bit higher level of sport. Uh, for anybody not familiar, Southern Utah is, is a really, really tough job. It, you know, it, it's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. you got to convince kids to move from other states, go out there and play there. So it's a really tough job. You're not necessarily getting the uh, cream of the crop coming out of high school. Uh, but anyways, working with these guys, I, I mean, you every two to three weeks, you're just kind of saying, man, we're, we're making ridiculous progress just because they still are athletes. They're very athletic. They're division one guys. But they were just so undertrained that as long as you got them breathing hard and, and you know sweating and just somewhat intelligently lifting with with good technique, you, you just seen results go through the roof. And so for me, I mean, you know me a long time. Obviously, I, I take a lot of pride in you know how we get these guys to perform over time and and you know the day one to the day you know one thousand and one process of it. Uh, but to me, it was just really really cool to watch that progression and watch how quickly these guys can make results. And so it just kind of was a compounding effect. It kind of snowballed into, you know, I enjoyed being around those guys. Uh, I enjoyed the energy they had. I enjoyed how much progress they were making because th there's still a reality that these guys don't come in quote unquote untrained. The, the training is just not probably the way you or I would train them. You know, if, if you're, only tool is a couple of rubber bands and, you know, an eight pound med ball. And that's, that's all you've trained with for five years well, let's put a barbell in your hands and all of a sudden you're going to, you're going to blow up because I'm still giving you a training aid of about zero. It, mm -hmm. you, know, you never actually applied real resistance. Yeah. Um, so when that happened, that also coincided with the, the fact that I was making like $24,000 a year. I had a wife, I had a kid, 
Uh, you know like what? A, King out in Cedar City, man. Oh, in Cedar City, man. I think we had an eight, eight bedroom house, five bathrooms oh. look like a king for a oh, twenty four thousand a year. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, get, a, get a penthouse in Vegas while you're out there, man. Oh no. my goodness. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> um no, but it was uh it was funny because uh, you know, I'm I'm gonna real quick digress. You know, you see a lot of it where people, you know, they really complain about salaries and they complain about, oh, you know, this is an entry level job, it's paying thirty three thousand, but I got four years of school and two years of the masters, and I got this and that. And I don't want to make thirty three, I wanna make, you know, eighty five or, or whatever that number is. And hey, your number's your number. If you can get it, go get it. But if you can't, I always looked at it like just what a crazy springboard opportunity. Yeah. Um you know, would it have been feasible for me to do that for 15 straight years at that salary? You know, probably not. Uh, but you, suck, you, know, you would, you would like you would correct. leave yourself out, you know, and it, it's a, if you don't believe in yourself and you look at that as opportunity as underpaying you, that probably means that you think that's, the, if you don't get it early, you're never going to get it later. Right. And like you're yeah. developing your worth is something that scares you, intimidates you, or it excites you. And you have this opportunity to prove yourself and earn more. And sometimes it means leaving, but the other side of it is like, if you're intimidated by not being able to make enough about a certain school, but you don't see the bigger picture of the opportunity, probably already weeded yourself out in the first place, but sorry. No, no. I mean, that's all great points. And I, and I think there's, you know, there it's so nuanced and, and there's so much more information we need to take into account. I mean, I mean just everybody you talk to has been doing this thing 10, 15, 20 years, you know, and myself included, we all say, you know, if I look back and, and I was looking at the programs I wrote when I was first starting out, like I would have fired myself. I would never have hired myself. And it's, it's like, wait a minute, the programs were that bad. And I'm telling you that, you know, they were, they were okay. <laughs> they definitely yeah. weren't great, but you know, I, you think you make 85,000 to write programs at 10 years from now, you're saying, man, I like, I'd have fired myself and put that on the floor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But then the, I think the other flip side is, you know, college athletics, you know, whether it's the actual athletes themselves or whether it's coaching, man, it is a high, high mountain peak and there's not a lot of real estate on the top. You know, for every, you know, thousand kids playing football, 990 of them, you know, 999 of them are not going to get a division one football scholarship, right? There, there's, there's just so much space. Everybody wants to do it, but there's just not enough room for everybody. Um, and, you know, same in coaching. You know, there's only one head coach, you know, there's only one head strength coach. And so there's just not a lot of room, you know, at the top of that mountain. And so I think if you're not willing to go into the thing saying, hey, it's a nomadic lifestyle, you've got to move around. Um, you know, I, I think you're kind of setting yourself up for failure. So for me, it was just it was just one of those opportunities where it was like, hey, you know, it's a springboard opportunity. Um you know, chance I'm going to my first check, my first real job, my first opportunity. You know, I know I'm going to have to leave at some point uh, if I want to progress my career. Uh, you know, I really enjoyed working with basketball. You know, life just kind of has a funny way, I think, of working out where if, you, if you're trying to do things the right way, and you work really, really hard. Um, you know, usually you can find an opportunity. And so University of Texas Arlington was hiring for a men's and women's basketball position. It was going to, you know, essentially give me about a thousand dollar a month pay raise. Uh, I mean, it was just, it, it was a good step up that ladder. So, you know, packed up my wife, my kid, uh, my pregnant wife. So we're about to have a second on the way and uh, yeah, moved to Texas. You know, it, it was one of those things too. When we actually got there, we, we loved it a lot. We were, we actually, after the first few months, we started uh, looking for, you know, neighborhoods and we were actually going to buy a house thinking we might be there three or four years uh, and after the first season, had the opportunity to come back open and go back to my alma mater at Utah State and went out to Logan, Utah, was there for four years. And, you know, now, like I said, going on year six here in Houston. So, you know, it is a little bit nomadic. You get to move around a little bit, but, you know, it should always be a springboard into the next opportunity. Did, did you by chance have Jake Scharnhorst and Mark Uyama at Utah State? I got both of them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Uwe was the, uh, was the first – uh, strength coach I had, um, man, I, I really, really enjoyed training with Dewey. Um, Jake came in, you know, did things a lot differently. And it's, you know, and I'll give you this one too, like big credit to a guy like Dave. Again, you know, Dave Scholl was kind of giving his flowers on this one. Uh, Uwe and Jake, you know, there's obviously going to be a lot of similarities, but there was a lot of differences as well. And I think one of the good things that, you know, I was able to observe as an athlete, is, especially as someone who's really, really into the weight room, and there were some things that we did that I really liked. And there were some things Jake did that I really liked. And again, I'm talking as an athlete, there's things, you know, you, you don't necessarily want to do or like to do, but still good for you. And you do it. 
um, you know, that both of them did as well. And so even when I would ask Dave, I'm like, hey, man, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? Like, we used to do this. You know, we used to do that. Because there was even coaching changes after, you know, Jake again and same type questions. You know, and, and Dave would just do a good job. You know, hey, there's more than one way to skin a cat. This is where you're going to see some benefits. You know, that other stuff works. This works. More than one thing works. Um, you know, some teams run power. Some teams spread it out. You know, both can win games. So, you know, there's more, way one do, or more than one way to do it. So, you know, yeah, it was uh, it was fun. I think really highly of both those guys. I'm, I'm very grateful and appreciative that I had the opportunity to cross paths on, you know, my athletic journey. Yeah. So, so um, I interned at Ole Miss when Jake was in charge of men's basketball there and then um, hmm. and the system in football. So I have a, I have a really good intersection with Jake. Um, I just yeah. great guy. But I've also had an intersection with Mark Uyama where we spoke at a hammer strength clinic out here in LA and I mm. um, was introduced to him and stuff. And like, without any provocation, it just went in on it. Like, what are your goals? <laughs> what do you want to do with your career? So, um, and it was like super aggressive. It was like, caught me off guard. And I was like, Hey, I'm nice to meet you. My name is Tim kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> you know, let's like, take me to dinner first here kind of thing. Um, with that being said, when you made that decision to go from Southern Utah to UT Arlington, did you by chance reach out to one or both of them? And did they say like, that's actually a bad career move? And you could tell me if that's too, too invasive, but like, I think this comes up quite a bit. You call your mentors and they kind of just, Hey, I don't think if you want to work with football, this is in the wrong direction. Or, Hey, if you want to get back to the big, like the power five or some sort of bigger football program, you're taking a step laterally, if not backwards. Like, did that conversation yeah. come up or is that like something that, you just knew in your heart and you didn't need confirmation from either of those guys. You know, I, uh, I actually, I spoke to with Jake. I spoke to a bunch of guys about it, but uh, you know, I spoke to Jake and it was interesting because at that point, nobody, nobody told me, uh, Hey, don't take the job mm -hmm. right, at all. Um, but what one thing Jake told me and to this day, it still sticks out to me is he said, when you get down, and this was not me even asking, you talk about just a great guy that said, hey, look, you know, I've seen this. You, you probably don't even know the right questions to ask yet. Uh, but he just kind of starts giving me some good advice. And he tells me, he said, when you get down there, don't even move on past the warm-up until the warm-up is exactly what you want to see. And I'm kind of listening to it. You know, and I kind of heard that before, you know, kind of like, he's like, ah, I'm going to wait till the warm-up's perfect and then we'll, we'll move and this and that. Uh, but he told me, he's like, you need to set the temperature immediately for how you want to run your program. And if, if the warm up is not right, then the guys are going to know, hey, it's, you know, there's not really that much of a standard. There's not really that much attention to detail. It's, it's this guy's just another guy up front talking and we're going to go lift some weights. Mm -hmm. And so that one's actually stuck with me to this day of don't even move on from the warm up. And as, as funny as it sounds, when I took the job at UH, uh, you know, we, we've been a very, very successful program. I've been here for five years. And in the last five years, we're it's us, Gonzaga, and Kansas are the three winningest programs in Division One basketball. And so, I mean, we've won a lot of games over the last five years. You know, some very, very high-level guys. But my very first day working with the team at UH, we, I mean, we might have spent 40, 50 minutes just trying to get through the warm up and getting for the through the first set of tempo runs, you know, coming off an extended break, just trying to get them up, moving around. Uh, we just had a lot of guys that were transfers in. So not guys that had been there, but, you know, whether uh, freshmen, jukes, transfers, uh, they, they just weren't understanding it. Guys, we're just paying attention to detail. I understand that you stepping on a line by a quarter of an inch or being behind the line by a quarter of an inch when we start a drill, that's probably not going to be the reason that we win or lose a game or, or make or miss a shot, you know, in, in eight months. But the habits that we're building, you know, these are the million dollar habits of we are paying attention to detail, whether we're fresh or whether we're fatigued. That's just how we're building is we're always going to pay attention to detail. And so that one actually has stuck me on really, really good. Um, but yeah, going more to your question about transitioning from football to basketball, you know, I've told some people this, you know, I've probably not done it in a podcast before, but as I'm at Utah state, you know, I was a top assistant there. And so I had a few opportunities over the years to go take over some programs. Yeah. Now, all of them were FCS programs, which I, I do not think that is a bad job or a lesser job. They're just jobs that didn't make sense. Um, but I had a handful of jobs that were presented to me of, of 
you know, and, and when you're in coaching, a lot of times, you you know, you start to understand jobs are not offered until you're saying yes type of a thing. And it's kind of hard to understand if you've never been in that situation. Um, but the job is not necessarily offered until you said yes. But in FCS, they get offered a lot before you say yes, right? So some, some were, some were not. Uh, but there was a couple of, you know, the FBS jobs that I really wanted. Um, I was a top two candidate on two jobs. Um, I started getting a little bit of frustration on the football side, just wondering why some of those jobs that I really wanted were not available. Um, you know, because I really thought that was going to be my next step was either taking over a full department with football or just taking over a football program. And, you know, then the opportunity presented itself to take over the Olympic sport. And, you know, I, there was obviously a lot of self-reflection. There was a lot of thoughts on where do I want to take my career? What's going to be best for my family? And I, I decided I wanted to go really, you know, head first and dive into that Olympic sport basketball side of things. And yeah, I mean, those conversations were had and I had some great mentors that, you know, hey, if you take this job, it doesn't mean anything on your coaching ability. This would be really hard for someone to think that guy's not going to walk away from football again. He's done it before. You know, you could say I did it at Southern Utah because I was working football there. You could say I did it at Utah State. And now if I'm trying to get back into football, someone could look at you and you have a perception being he's going to walk away again for another opportunity. So, you know, I, but I also believe, man, again, like I said, just work really, really hard, try to do things the right way. But, but I also believe you need to bet on yourself. And so that was part of the deal. Yeah, just, just I knew that I could go and do what I wanted to do, train guys the way I wanted to train them. I knew we were going to have the resources that I could implement from a nutritional standpoint, what I wanted to do nutritionally with the guys, uh, training with the guys. I just thought we could run a really holistic approach because I only had, you know, 13 guys I was going to be working with at the time. So, yeah, I no, no regrets at all. I'm, what, what is the opposite of regrets? I couldn't be happier with, yeah, with yeah. that decision. And so, you know, who, who knows what five or 10 years holds from today? You know, my crystal ball is as good as yours, but I just, you know, this is the world I see myself in. Um, you know, I, I just signed a, you know, multi-year deal to be around here for a while. So I, I have zero, zero thoughts on moving on. I mean, I, I love working for the guy that I'm working for. You know, that's advice I try to give everybody is when you're in a position that oh, you gosh. can choose your head coach, choose your head coach wisely. Because that's, you know, you're going to be in a spot you can be happy. And when you're happy, don't, don't be quick to mess with happy. Man. Yeah. So, you know, one, one thing I really want to just elaborate on from what you just described there is like, there's no like clear delineated path on how to, what, what to do and when to do it. Like no one has any idea, but I would say this, like there's now as a mentee with several people that I've worked with versus being a mentor to several people. It's this thought of like, it always scares me when someone goes to me like, I'm going to work with basketball or I'm going to work with football. Like you have no idea where this path or journey is going to take you and you don't have a choice. You know, like it just, it is what it is. Like, hey, during practice, basketball team needs someone to work with. Who knows that Southern Utah guy goes on and gets a Utah job down the road. He's like, I'm taking Allen with me, right? That's happened with so many people that I've worked with, right? And just organically, it just, materialized into now this person's at Duke working with men's soccer, this person's at Missouri working with basketball and like, just, Hey, I need someone to do this. Right. Like I was working with this basketball at Georgia tech and I no interest in that whatsoever. Like I have no, like I'm five foot eight, can't jump worth a lick. No one's gonna be like, Oh yeah, that's a basketball guy on staff for sure. Just out of necessity, someone needed to do it. And I was the guy. Right. And like that process unfolded and like that decision of like, Eh, do I need to be a football guy? Like, that'd be sweet. Do I need to be a basketball guy? That'd be sweet. I applied to the same position uh, Preston did at Clemson. Obviously, I had no idea what I was competing against and putting my name in for. Like, the guy's a, probably one of the most recognized men's basketball strength coaches out there. And like, I just, oh, screw it. It seems like a pretty sweet gig. You work with 15 guys. <laughs> you got live in Clemson, South Carolina, low cost, low cost of living. Like, I'll do it. And I didn't know I was going to be a basketball guy. Like, oh, no, hey, you don't need to get get even a call back like great i'll just move on to the next thing i'll go to usc and be a football strength coach there like and i would say to like the young coach of like the advice that jake gave you it's like he never said i don't know man that seems like a backward step or that's the wrong direction if you want football i just told you when you get there focus on this yeah. like, as a mentor that's a great like thing that for us all to remind ourselves like we don't fucking know like we have no idea like just hey present your present to the person that's looking for you to guidance of when you get there, if you do make that choice, just do a really good job. 
And here's some things that I really focus on. Like, I, that's a really good like lesson. I mean, just Jake, I'm not surprised, man. He's just like, he's wise. And I think so just passionate and caring. Like he's been in Idaho for what, 15 years now. I mean, yeah. like he survived how many people and dro- like whatever the dynamic is in Idaho. But like, you know, I think that level of like all of us can take a lesson from younger coaches, but um, yeah, and well, and I'll even tell you this. I don't know if, if you heard actually. He he, they finally caught up to him, so he, he finally got clipped at Idaho. Um, oh no, no, yeah, oh, man, man, it's oh. tough, tough deal. Just oh, you know, geez, and geez. Right. yeah, man. But you're going to put a bust up there for him. Oh, I thought they were going to name the weight room after that. <laughs> but, uh, and you know what? I, I think the other thing too is you know, uh, I, I want to get back and I want to talk in a second about what you said about guys saying I want to be a basketball guy, a football guy, X, Y, Z. But I want to go back on Jake because to me, Jake's one of those those same guys where if you just do things the right way, um, you know, and I, I like saying be a good person, but that's obviously very subjective. Um, but, you know, just kind of go and rule that thing. But, you know, he, he just tries doing things the right way. And so when I spoke to him, you know, kind of shortly after he, you know, and again, this is just very, very recently. But, I mean, he's got a positive attitude. He, he's just got a positive outlet. He's still betting on himself. You know, hey, I'm going to have some opportunities. I'm going to have some of this and some of that. Because it's just when you have that self-confidence of knowing the value that you bring, you're going to be fine, right? At the end of the day, it's going to work itself out. Uh, but I think the other side of that, too, is you kind of learn this lesson in coaching as well. As like, I mean, we're talking about Jake. He's one of our friends. You know, no hard feelings. I mean, it's coaching. You know, you, you don't like that he got clipped, but you can't hold it against a guy that's, you know, that ended up getting offered the job after because those are going to be more professional opportunities, you know, maybe for young intern GAs that you're trying to help on their way up, yeah. um, you know, and you just, you just never know. So then I've seen some people make that mistake where a coaching change happens and there's a lot of kind of vitriol directed at the person who takes over. It's like, man, no, they, they bet on themselves once upon a time, this is now their opportunity. Um, and, and again, it's not, it's not their fault that a job was open and they took a job. So, yeah, I, I mean, but yeah, I think the world of Jake, man, I'm very, to this day, very appreciative because it was how many years later that that advice I'm sitting there watching it play out in real time. And again, the, the, the one kid that made us redo the drill over and over and over, uh, you know, he was a Nigerian kid who transferred into us from another university and he just didn't know. I mean, he just had no idea you know what I'm saying. Hey, behind the line just not something he ever had to do he just didn't get it and so by the end of the day when we restarted drills over and over and over again i know that now they get it right um but no what you said though about you know i want to be this guy i want to be that guy if you have that you hey i want to work football great that is your goal and and look i want to be a division one football director hey man chase your dreams your goals that's awesome but if you're three months into coaching Let's draw a parallel to what if you're three months into playing sports? What if you're a 10 year old and you're saying, you know, I'm going to specialize in football or I'm going to specialize in basketball. Well, yeah, maybe it'll work itself out. But what's your goal? If your goal is just, Hey, I just want to have fun, play the game. I enjoyed this atmosphere environment. Well, maybe that opportunity comes when you're a basketball guy that just didn't keep growing, but Hey, you can go play safety. You can go play corner. You know, maybe you, you're a football guy who just didn't have the skill set for a position, but uh, you're a pretty good wrestler, though, right? And so I think it's the same thing. I think as coaches, um, I've seen a lot of that. And I think part of it is just the way athletics has trended where there's, you know, there's a football staff, there's an Olympic staff, a lot of team, you know, baseball, a lot of places has their own guy. Men's women's basketball have their own guy. Um, you know, but if everyone's got their own person, I can see that you might walk into it thinking you need to try to be selective and you need to try to specialize early. I just, I, I don't like that approach. I think you should try to have a broad approach. Um, you know, I give you an example. One of my former assistants here at UH, you know, he was brought down and it is a men's basketball assistant job. So you talk about, you know, just set up and being an awesome, like I have a paid assistant in addition to myself, who's, you know, a paid employee. So there's two of us that are being paid to work with 13 guys. It's, it, we can get so much done at a high level. It's awesome. But he had a baseball background. And then I told him, I'm like, hey, look, you and me are not going to be on the floor watching the women's strength coach train people. Like, if, if, if she needs help, we are going to go be her assistants, right? So I'm, I'm the head basketball for men, but I'm on the floor being told what to do by the women's strength coach. I'm her assistant when she's on the floor. And then Jake was able to get next door and go work with baseball. 
uh, because he had a little bit of downtime. And, and to be honest, sometimes it was a little bit, you know, inconvenient where maybe I had to pick up some things where when you have duties split between two people, especially when you're doing all the nutrition things, there's always something to do. Um, but he'd be over there working baseball and now he's working with the Mets, you know, and he's carved out a career that veered from, I was at Mizzou basketball. I was at Texas basketball. I went down to UH basketball and now I'm working with the Mets because of what he was able to do with the UH baseball team. And so it, it just goes to that point of you never know, you know, kind of how the, the opportunities are going to present themselves. But if you would have just locked in and said, nope, I'm a, I'm a basketball guy, I'm not, you know, he, he would have missed out on that opportunity to go be in the majors, which was really his dream from the beginning. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, I just think as you were talking, like I did an internship at Harvard where we had 41 sports and three strength coaches and um, yeah. I had to. I had to do every sport and there was times we had multiple sports in at a time. So some of the assistants were like, you gotta take field hockey. You gotta take, you gotta take women's lacrosse. Like you have to take them by yourself. And that opportunity at such a young age and being responsible for a team and having such a, a versatile like list of groups that we're working with, like the range was immense from male, female, field sports, court sports, Olympic sports, football, like everything. And, Every sport you came through, you had a hand in. And as you start to progress into like the higher levels of college football or college basketball, like you still have that backbone of like, I could teach anyone how to do a hand clean. I can teach anyone how to do a front squat. Like just put them in front of me. I don't care. Like, and then I can start to work with that coach and I can speak that coach language. Like, sure, I'll learn the intricacies of field hockey to be the best coach I can be for this sport and the athletes and the coaches and service them in the best possible way. But you know, that, I just, I didn't have a, I didn't have a leg to stand on. I didn't play sports at a high level. So it's not like I was married to anything anyway. And then it was probably one of the few internships that would take me because they needed the help and mm -hmm. the work was immense and the opportunities were even greater. And then off of that, like, all right, I go to Georgia Tech or Old Miss, wherever else I did my internships. And I had boatloads of experience teaching athletes that never touched a weight in their life with, and to combine that with athletes with incredible genetic potential, like, I can do yeah. whatever, you know? Um, so um, this is awesome. So I, I kind of want to shift gears here, if that's okay, with yeah. actually talking about contraction types. Cause you know, I, I think the thing that, you know, when I look at, you know, some of the programming stuff that you got going on, which is, is pushing that threshold and boundaries off of like what, you know, I think the perception off of basketball training, I, and I'm, and I think there's another dynamic to go into here. It's like, if you haven't caught up with some of the basketball strength conditioning out there, some of the baseball strength conditioning out there, and you have this like this limited perspective off of like what these guys and or men and women are doing with these athletes from a training perspective. And it's not like it's not this thought of like, oh, it's basketball. They don't even train hard. Like it's not even it could be further from the truth. So I hope that narrative is getting out there to more and more people and you and all the social that you got and everyone else out there that's working with some of these sports that's not football. Like it, it's the level is so high right now. And I can't see mm -hmm. enough praises for the, the stuff that, you know, you, and it, and the thing is too, I'm sure this gets frustrating for you of like, you're looking at this end product of like months of doing a dynamic warm up for 50 minutes or just empty bar or like just going through basics until you see into the finished product of like, if you just work hard at it and you're consistent and you're, con and you're, discipline and you hold your guys accountable like you can get to these parts so they're seeing the the end of like a probably months and months of that prep work but you know what what i would like to get into is you know your thought of okay what how do you think about i guess a repetition and its allocation off of eccentric isometric or concentric portions um and you can go into this in multiple directions of it just from a general every all the rep has to have all three or you can go into it of like Hey, early on in athlete's development, I'm thinking I need to develop isometric or eccentric strength, and then I'm trying to peak them for this specific thing. Um, so take the floor, contraction types. What is your initial thought? And like, where would you like to go with this conversation? Yes, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm, I'm gonna throw a bunch of the puzzle pieces out there, and then I'm gonna try to connect them back together. But, uh, but I think all of our decision making is influenced by our previous experience. Uh, it's influenced by new information. It's, it's influenced by a lot of things, but there's no exact roadmap 
it's just maybe more of a guide of, hey, this is probably the direction the training should be going. This is probably the direction to get us to where we're trying to go. Um, but it's, I think first, we do need to zoom out a little bit and just say, you know, if you were to say training football, okay, well, what if you're training a team in the Big Ten that's going to line up two tight ends and a fullback and you got a whole bunch of 330 pound human dinosaurs that are about to blow you off the ball and they value something a little bit different than maybe if you're out in the Pac-12 where they're running five wide, you know, the, the offensive linemen are, you know, they might be listed to 290 but they're all Chicken probably about, football yeah yeah, yeah just, <laughs> you said it not me yeah. but you got a bunch of you know, <laughs> relax relax, relax. <laughs> but you got a bunch of you got a bunch of 200 you know 275 pound linemen with with three foot gaps you know or four foot gaps or you know you, you're just talking about a, it's it's both football but it's two completely different games of football Right. And so if you were to say, well, how do you train basketball? Well, I mean, I don't know. Are you going to play with a ton of ton of space and play with, you know, four guards that can get out and boogie and, you know, in your quote unquote, you're big. All he needs to do is he just needs a rim run, just sprint down to the other rim, try to create some spacing, do, do this, that, the other, be a, be a rim protector. Or are you going to go another style where we're going to say, hey, we're essentially having three seven footers on the floor at a time. And, you know, there it's going to be a slower pace of play and, I mean, it's, so basketball is basketball. You know, the rules are the same. You know, the, the lines, the hoops, everything's the same. But I do think you need to have a little bit of a understanding and a needs analysis of how are we going to play. And so within, you know, my understanding of, of what my boss is looking for out of our guys, first and foremost, they need to be able to survive practice because if, if you're not a huge college basketball fan, you know, Everybody can talk about identity and culture and what they want it to be. And then what the rest of the country actually perceives it to be. And ours is we are a very, very physical, tough, defensive, crash the board rebound. It is just a hard playing game. And one of our fundamentals that I think, I think you get lost across all sports is that playing hard is a fundamental. The same way dribbling, the same way passing, the same way free throws, those are fundamentals. But playing hard and then finding a way that there's still a step above playing hard and that's competing, right? That is a fundamental. And so for us, we, we'll go five on five. And, you know, I, I, it's kind of funny talking about, you know, Pac-12 football. I remember when I was in high school, the thing that was everyone was saying about USC and everyone was saying about Miami kind of back when they were, you know, dominating college football at the time was that, you know, they don't, uh, well, what was it? They, they don't like, you know, reload. They just, or, or well, how does the saying go? You know, they, they don't restock, they reload or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah. But, you know, they, they got so many guys coming, uh, coming up behind and they were saying the best game in the pac 12 this week was USC's practice ones versus ones because they always went good on good, right? Mm -hmm. One team O versus one team D. Uh, same in Miami. And so for us, it's that same way where there, you know, there's been times where you know the best team or the best game being played in our league was was our practice because it's just it is a physical, fast paced, aggressive style of play, and we go five on five, you know, good on good, essentially the whole way through. And so if that's what we're going to do, well, now you got to start coming up with strategies of not just how do you win a game, it's how do you get through practice? Because that's the demand they're going to face. Okay. And then the other thing is when we recruit, we value length so much more maybe than height, right? So our, uh, you know, our starting five men this year is probably going to be one or two players. One of them would either be six foot seven with a seven foot five wingspan, or he's going to be just about six foot six with like a seven, two, seven, three wingspan. So we just value guys who bring a tremendous amount of length more, you know, we, we don't necessarily need those seven footers. We, we, we got guys with those same wingspans, uh, but they're probably a little bit more athletic, but they're also probably a little thinner type guys, uh, just that, that body type. So now you got to look at it and say, look, let's not even talk about testing vertical jumps. Let's not even, talk about testing x y or z they're being recruited here because they play above the rim right we had a, one of our players from last year won the dunk contest after the season uh and, and you know the dunk that ended up winning for it he literally went up and dunked and just hung on his elbow 
over the rim. Um, you know, just hung there. And so you just talk about just that's what we value is that that athleticism, that length. And so part of those attributes, you got to get big and strong because that's how we're going to play. And we truly have a developmental program where we're not just turning this roster over every one or two years with new, you know, jukes and transfers. We have guys who are program guys that have been training hard for years and years. So these young guys come in, these new guys come in, and you got to find a way to get them caught up. Uh, because again, if they're already playing above the rim and they are, they're shifty, quick, explosive guys, well, where's your time going to be best spent? Well, the way we play, you, you're probably going to need to get stronger. You're probably going to need to put on a little bit of size. And then, you know, as you progress down your you know, playing career, we'll shift to a few things and then kind of shift our priorities. So when you start talking about the rep, uh, to me, uh, rep integrity is, is, just beyond important. And I think you can look at it from a few different ways. Uh, you know, a guy comes in, knock on wood, his rep is not great. And now he tweaks a peck. Well, how do you explain that to a head coach? I, sorry, we're just pushing a little too hard, right? Like we're just working a little too hard. I mean, that's, yeah, maybe, but how many of those do you actually get? And realistically that can never happen. Um, you know, so for us, to, to me, how important is the rep? Well, the rep integrity is critical. And then you start looking at it, and, and I'm going to look at another puzzle piece. I've, I've shifted my view, and it's one thing I tell everybody, is, is I'm just focused on attributes. And, and whatever we're doing from a needs analysis standpoint, how do we saturate attributes more so than how do we just satur you know, saturate an exercise? Now, how we load that exercise, how we perform the exercise, will influence how we saturate an attribute. But I think we, we should change our focus and our shift a little bit to what attributes are we trying to develop? Um, and I think that'll, at that point, again, kind of open up a, a broader horizon into, into how we can go about doing what we do. And so then at that point, if you're saying, hey, if we're trying to saturate an attribute, okay, well, we've got multiple days a week, we, we can expose them to multiple exposures across many different things. I think that's where, you know, kind of what we're going to dive into today, a big shift happened in how I'm programming. And this is, you know, going on about three years now, you know, started with something I was doing, evolved into what I started doing with my developmental and redshirt guys. And then at that point it, it evolved and I'll run it with the entire team. And that's, you know, what has been coined by, uh, Christian Thibodeau is, you know, omni contraction training. Uh, you know, we talked about Ben Prentice. I actually consulted with him. Uh, you talk about just a guy who knows his stuff. Just called him, you know, talked to him a few times, asked what his rate was, and then locked him in. And, and man, it was worth its weight in gold, right? even more so. Yeah. Uh, but, I, but, you know, he calls it his quad current system. It is a very, very similar system. Uh, but, but it's funny because even with Omni contraction, you can go back to the old Mike Mentzer stuff, right? And his Omni contraction was within the rep itself, you know, kind of taking it to that failure concentrically, then isometrically, and then overloading it with that last rep eccentrically, truly going to failure. So, you know, terminology wise, when I'm referring to Omni contraction, again, all the credit in the world of Christian Thibodeau, um, you know, I'm talking about dedicating a day to a contraction type. So for us, we'll dedicate an entire day to an eccentric uh, contraction emphasis. We'll dedicate a day to an isometric contraction emphasis, dedicate a day to, you know, concentric. Um, and then we, we train four days a week. So we'll go Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday in the weight room. Uh, they're still getting after it on the court every day. But for us, I like to kind of use that fourth day as a, you know, maybe a gaps day, just kind of hitting some of the things we might have missed. Uh, you know, or, you know, you start talking the difference between being, you know, between football and basketball. Uh, yeah, I've heard it put in a really good way that football is almost like doing logistics for the army where you've got so many people and you've got to plan so far out, you know, even months in advance uh, and everything's got to be to the T to get this, this massive group of people and all this equipment from point A to point B. And then basketball, it's kind of like the Navy SEALs. Like these dudes just kind of drop in unexpected, unannounced all hours of the day. And you just, you just got to kind of keep your head on a swivel, mm -hmm. right? So even though you may have the, the best plan, the most perfect plan in the world, you still got to be super flexible. And, and just how do we get the main thing in and how do we keep the main thing, the main thing? So for me, that, that's why this also fit in 
uh, just because the evolution of the training of it, it actually started with overloaded eccentrics and utilizing weight releasers. And as I'm working through weight releasers, uh, you know, I, I, I can even remember when I kind of was at my wits end on this deal. Cause I'm like, man, like I got to get the, you know, these five sets of clusters in. And then after that, I got to do some, I, it was actually a hamstring curl and there was going to be, uh, you know, a statodynamic rep, uh, with pauses at the midpoint of every rep that was going to follow that right after. And I get done with all of my overloaded eccentric work. And I'm just like, man, like I've been going at this thing for like 45, 50 minutes already. I'm gassed. Uh, there's no way I can finish out the rest of the session. I'm looking at the rest of the week. The rest of the week now feels like it's a little bit shot because everything's kind of been affected by what I missed today. Um, and at that point, it's kind of, you know, entering the, you know, the Christian Thibodeau and the, and the Ben Prentiss influence of, you know, and I even remember with Ben when he told me the first time, I was kind of like, I just, I just don't know if, I, if that makes sense to me. Just one day, only eccentrics, and then come back the next day and just do only isometric emphasis work. I was like, I, 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 I just don't know, man. I just, I just don't think that's going to be it. But he, he, again, that guy's earned all the respect in the world. So I'm not going to say that. I'm just going to say, look, if he sees this and he thinks this, there's got to be something to it. Um, you know, maybe it works for his environment, not mine. I don't know, but there's something to it. Uh, and so eventually I just, you know what, I'm just going to dive in. And anybody who's ever been around me, I, I'm a huge advocate of buying programs from other coaches. Um, and I'm a really big advocate of buying them from coaches you know, like yourself, that you're making a living off of you training people. And so not every coach, you know, is going to necessarily want like remote coaching with, uh, you know, the phone turned around, doing it on video, X, Y, Z. Maybe you just want to see what another coach program so you can see what they value. And for me, that's where the biggest benefit comes. And if I'm buying a program from someone, I can see what they value. Mm. And a lot of times you'll see what they value by what's in that A1, you know, exercise selection, right? Yeah. And so I was buying some programs from Christian Thibodeau uh, and, I, and I'm looking at some of it. I'm like, well, hey, hold on, wait a minute here. Like there's a whole day dedicated to eccentric and it's, there's just two exercises. It's a bench press and a squat with the weight releasers. And then the next day, everything's the isometric. And then the next day it's a constant. I'm like, all right, hold on. Like I, you know, I'm talking to Ben about this. I'm seeing how Christian actually laid out his training session I think, I think this would work actually at a really, really high level. So I went from hearing it saying, I don't think that makes much sense. I, I'm a very visual learner. Um, so then I actually saw it on paper and I was like, oh, hold on now, wait a minute. This makes a lot of sense, especially for what we're trying to do. And, you know, this, this kind of periodization. Uh, so I, I ran it on myself. Uh, you know, you know, as well as I do after, after you train for enough years, you know, unless you got a, you know, some, some pretty good help. You know, from, from an outside source, it gets really hard to just keep making big jumps in progress. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I did was when I switched up and I went to a daily contraction emphasis, I, I mean, the adaptation was, was quick and it was huge. Um, and I was just like, well, hold on now, man. I've seen more progress here in the last six months than I've probably seen in the previous six years. There's something here. And so after I ran it on myself, I, I overthought it thought it more overthought it just kept and then I put a program together for my guys that were developmental guys and just say you know what worst case scenario there, there's still going to be great training in here but worst case scenario we, we tossed this at the end of the semester it didn't work um you know nothing's going to be lost they still learned how to train they had great technique but we got the end of the semester and, I, and I'm sitting there and I'm like all right there's something here like what's going on these dudes are just blowing up right now ran it through the next semester. Uh, and then I made the decision. I said, you know what? I'm going to put the whole team on this style of training over the summer. Ran the whole team through it just for the summer and, and for a little bit heading into the preseason. Uh, but for me, you know, you, you know how this works for anybody else listening who's not familiar within the NCAA. Uh, men's basketball is allotted eight weeks that we can have our guys on campus in the summer. So that's June and July. So here at UH, it works out really well. We get four weeks in June. We give them a week off for the 4th of July, come back four weeks in July, give them a couple weeks off, and then school starts. So I really run that Omni Contraction training style June and July. And then when we get back, I, I really, really pull it back for a few weeks, but we still run it while we're shifting our emphasis to more of a uh, conditioning, a speed, just getting ready for the season type of an emphasis. 
Um, Cause I don't want to throw anything too novel in the weight room. I just want to keep working, you know, kind of the same stimulus that we've been exposing them to. And then after that, you, you know, it's, it's almost more of a, you know, a hybrid of things that I picked up from Charles, a hybrid of things that I picked up from organizing almost like a, like a tier system with a total body uh, from Joe Ken, but you know, that off season, you know, that, that good eight to 10, you know, 10 to 12 weeks of running an omni contraction, you know, we've had phenomenal success. And, you know, again, it's just dedicating a day to each that all evolved from me trying to figure out how can I get all the work done when I'm utilizing overloaded eccentrics and we're just running out of time because it takes a lot of time to build up to those reps. Yeah. So that that's the nutshell version, which is, you know, kind of takes a long time to explain out. No, no. And, and honestly, just a really cool that, uh, I mean, Ben's a close, I, I don't know if I call him, I call him a close friend. I don't know if he calls me a close friend, but either way, I'm going to say that. Um, he, um, it's funny how, like, whenever you talk to Ben, he always seems like he's annoyed by every question, but he always goes this really long, <laughs> long, super uh, in-depth answer. Like, oh God, you know, it's just quadrant contraction <laughs> method. Like, you know, it's just... <laughs> I mean, you just fucking work on something you know, like eccentric for a day, isometric for a day, concentric. Like, wait, wait, what? Like, what are we talking about right now? Like, elaborate. Oh, well, you know, this, that, and the other. Um, there's a couple things I really want to get into um, yeah. off of everything you just went into. But I thought a ton of gems in there. But you, you use the term rep integrity. You know, I want you to go a little bit deeper into that. And like, let's say that it's a couple benchmarks, right? Like what is the set and rep scheme? What's the time and attention scheme? How do you want the exercise executed? What is a good rep? Like, can you elaborate more on that, like idea of rep integrity for you and what you're looking at? And is that something that you use to quantify how you do your job? Like I did a good job because everyone hit the rep that I wanted to hit the way we wanted to hit the way it was prescribed, or is there something more bigger that you're looking at? Is there something bigger I'm looking at? Yes. Is there something smaller? Yeah, probably. I mean, again, it's, it's, it's something that it's kind of like the Bruce Lee approach, right? You know, when you start a kick is a kick and a punch and a punch as a newcomer, you get a little bit better. You're kind of a intermediate. And then it's way, way bigger than a kick, way, way bigger than a punch. There's so much nuance to it. And then when you become an expert, you kind of get back to, no, like a kick is a kick and a punch is a punch. Right. And so to me, I, I think when you say rep integrity, there's always an underlying reality. And that's if, if you show me somebody who cheats technique, I'll show you someone who's going to get hurt. You know, it may not be today. And it may not even be in the four or five years that you're working with the kid. But what if it happens nine years from today when he's at his peak earning potential and he's in the NBA and he's just, you know, training on his own, getting his sets in and what you allowed to happen, he's still doing to this day. And then he tweaks something and that earning potential is now gone. Okay. Or what if it does happen in a week? Just because the kid's someone who really gets after it, really wants to push, you've allowed the rep to not be technically sound and not be, you know, is it ever perfect? A lot of times it's not, but how can that be your standard be anything less? Like I get it. You know, a lot of times good enough is good enough, but your standard needs to be, this needs to be perfect because if something goes wrong, how are you going to look in the mirror knowing that you did not demand it to be perfect and then something went wrong? So from the rep integrity standpoint, I think that sets us up, you know, really from a transference standpoint, not necessarily just back to the sport, but to other exercises, right? So if you are working RDLs and you understand how to, brace and what your back should look like and what your hips and your knees are doing well now we can take it down to the floor if we're working a top to bottom approach and say hey now we can start doing deadlifts start working in the clean poles you can do all these things that are connected okay what if it's part of a squat progression and you're saying this is what i want your torso to look like we're going to start with you know that hands-free heel elevated cyclist style squat um, i call it hands-free other people call it a frankenstein squat we're gonna move from that to no heel elevated just high torso we're gonna move from that to a front we're gonna move from that to a back right so now you have the transference because it's it's perfect reps so to me that's what i'm looking first and foremost at rep integrity is just get that thing so that it looks textbook so that i know we've eliminated a risk because it is a high risk facility that we work in and, and we're working with guys who competitive guys guys that are driven guys um Guys that probably want to do a little bit more weight on the bar, 
uh, you know, I was that kind of a guy myself. If, if, if it said 295, I was still putting 300 on the board. Like, you know, I, like you, you're, just, you're just trying to do that. Way cooler. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, 100%, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> what, what, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, what do you mean I got 310? No, no, put three plates on there. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so anyways, uh, you no, know, so that's first and foremost. But then once you've mastered and you, you've really got the concept of rep integrity down, well, now, what if you want to do overloaded eccentrics? I know that you know how to lower the rep. What if we want to do, you know, uh, rack lockouts, whether it be on a bench press, uh, you know, rack deadlifts, you know, anything along those lines where you better be pretty technically sound because if, if your hands are even just a little bit off and you're trying to press, well, now you've tweaked your torso and now you got a lot of strain on one side, not the other, and you're asking for a problem. Yeah. Okay, so for me, just understanding that the better you get at completing the rep, the more doors you open up and the more you know, possibilities you allow yourself with training, that's great. But now let's also live in the real world a little bit where if you got a kid you know, that broke his foot, broke his ankle when he was back in middle school, maybe he was you know, from an environment where he just couldn't go through the right medical treatment, couldn't go through the right rehab and you've got some issues like that, yeah, reps might not look as nice and everything with him as it does for others. So maybe you better have some other tricks up your sleeve of how you can get that same adaptation just with different exercises. But if you know what it should look like and you're saying that don't look right, then it's probably not right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's funny too. Sometimes, you know, in the world of brilliance is, is in simplicity. Um, you know, I going back to Dave Scholes and some great, you know, mentorship he gave me was, you know, these coaches, a lot of them, you know, they don't necessarily have a, a extensive background in strength and conditioning. You know, some of them have trained, some of them worked hard, but really good coaches just say, hey, look, I, I, did, I, I know what good looks like. I know what good doesn't look like. And I, I just want them in there and, and they want some boxes checked. Are the guys working hard? You know, is, is it well thought out, organized training? Um, you know, are, are you coaching your reps? And does it look good? Because if they walk in there and the training looks like shit, well, it's probably shit training, yeah. right? Like sometimes it is that simple, um, you know, or, or the other cliche of, you know, a, the best training program in the world run poorly is not as good as a poor program run the best in the world, you know, and that's, that's why if you get 10 different coaches, the exact same training program, you're going to get 10 different results. I think a lot of that is just, hey, the intent behind the movements, the effort being displayed, the consistency, but again, the rep integrity. And so when, when I say rep integrity, to me, it always comes back to you should be coaching it to look the way you want it to look. While also being aware that, look, these guys are here because they're really good, you know, at, at offensive rebounds, if they're a big man with long arms, or they're really good at dribbling the ball down a court seeing things across the whole spectrum, making the right pass and then getting back on defense or they're just really, really good at putting the ball in the bucket. Right. So knowing that these are strength generalists, not strength specialists, like you would see in power lifters, Olympic weightlifters, et cetera. So it's, you may never get to where a guy can just walk in, be a perfect technician. If you're not on the floor with every single exercise that you have in your toolbox, but it should be to that point where no matter what's on the floor, just with some minor cueing, you can have that thing looking exactly like you want it to look like. And, and to me, that's what it all comes down to is how do we get to that point? So we have options yeah. to move forward. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just one of the things that I thought was like really, really important off that just line of like, eventually you're going to saturate it in something. And if it's you're saturating it or pushing the threshold in something, and if it's not really quali quality, it's only going to manifest to be bad earlier. Right. And it's just going to expose you. And like that's performance training is like figuring out what you need to do and then doing it as hard as much and as frequently as possible to get to that point B as efficiently as possible. But that's all completely contingent upon the quality input you're doing with it. And if it's a shit input, it's going to be a shit output. And like, you know, I think that process too, it's like, it's all really good to get this like, magic bullet off of like the programming and exercise selection but if the execution of that is bad you're not going to get what you want so chicken or the egg but if the execution or the the premise or the hypothesis or whatever you thought of training is there like they're 
they're not mutually exclusive. Like you need both. You need them to be really high level. And it's probably better to start with a quality rep and then figure out how to adequately stress that exercise with it being really good. Um, you know, I just think the more and more I do this, the more and more that's becoming um, the exception and not the rule. And that's, I think just this conversation right here, hopefully resonates with a lot of young coaches. Cause it's like, yeah, it's great to get deep in the weeds on certain things, man. But like, if you can't coach it. And if you can't get what you want, you gotta go back a couple steps and get that to something that you can do at a high level consistently before you start to use any method or any specific exercise. Um, can so, I, can I piggyback off that real quick? Just yeah. 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 Please do. Okay, so, so there's one thing and this is not necessarily directed at anybody. It's just more of a thought that I think is, has kind of grown, but with a lot of coaches, you know, they're going to talk about, you know, these are elite level athletes. They're going to, they're going to find strategies to move the bar. They're going to find strategies to, to get in positions. And to me, there's a big difference between saying, you know, like I was talking about the kid earlier we had, who, you know, six, seven kid with a seven, five wingspan. Okay. His torso is the same size as, as our former women's basketball strength coach who was five foot three. So if you went hip to armpit, you literally do this and you go to the other one and it's the same length. Now the wingspan was a whole lot different, right? The, the leg length was a whole lot different. So to say that they have a natural strategy. Yes. If you're going to squat, that really, really tall kid is going to hinge because that is an advantageous strategy to keep the bar in a position to demonstrate where they can be strong. But to say, you know, hey, we're just going to tell them we, we got X, Y, Z exercises and just kind of let them figure it out and they'll figure it out. Well, is not part of the reason why you slow down reps and you work on isometrics is that you can expose where they get really good at being masters of, of compensation? And, you know, good. And, and again, going back to, you know, Thibodeau, he brought up a good point one time. And I only spent a little bit of time in Utah. So, I, you know, it, maybe it doesn't make sense, but, you know, I, I think it does. Uh, he was talking about when you're driving on ice. Okay. When you hit ice, you're not supposed to hit your brakes. If anything, you, you know, hit that black ice, you almost want to like speed up and just, just get through it as fast as you can and then get that traction back. Well, that same theory could apply. If you have somebody who's got an issue and all you're ever doing is speeding up through the bar, you may never, you know, or you're just dropping into the bottom of your squat, dropping into the bottom of your bench. You're never controlling the repetition. You may never expose that weakness because you just flew through it. But even when you're going over the ice, there, there's a traction issue, right? There's a weakness between your tire and that ice that you, have, you don't have control of the vehicle. And the same thing would apply if you don't have any control over certain aspects of the rep. And you're just saying, hey, just go ahead and figure it out. Well, you might get them being really, really good at moving really, really bad. And eventually that will get exposed or all these little micro traumas that you're creating eventually becomes a macro trauma. And so again, just, just going to that, that aspect of, of teaching, slowing down and, and understanding that it's a skill to me, that's where there's so much value. And it, and it's, and to say, you know, just let them figure it out, I think is a, is a crazy disservice to say oh you know they're going to find the strategy to work i think that's a crazy disservice is there a time and a place for that yes there is in certain things but i just think if you're going to load this kid up with with a lot of stress and a lot of resistance and then say hey let's let's do something it better be really really technically sound and you as a coach better have that coach's eye to know what that needs to look like and why it might look a little bit different, again, from the really, really short torso, long leg, long arm to maybe like me, you know, I, my arm length is something like that of a, you know, like a six, one person, you know, I'm, I'm closer to six, four, I just have really, really broad shoulders. And so it kind of disguises, you know, that I might have a big wingspan, but if I got really short arms, I've been a really good bench presser for a really long time. And my deadlift has been really, really bad for a really long time. Cause I'm walking around like a T-Rex. Right. Whereas the, the guys I was talking about, they, they can deadlift with ease because they can also scratch their ankles without bending over. Mm -hmm. Right. So understanding what something should look like, understanding how body type affects it, understanding, you know, how to implement the isometrics, the eccentrics to kind of expose and then get stronger in these weaknesses. To me, that's where there's so much value in rep integrity. Yeah. So um, 
going in the direction talking about the utilization of omni contraction. I think there's actually probably a part where you were just talking about body type and looking at rates of adaptation. But if I'm looking at eccentric, isometric, concentric, and that kind of transition from day to day, are you seeing different rates of contraction on individual days from one week to the next? When you're saying different rates of contraction, what do you mean? By that? Different rates of adaptation. Sorry, I misspoke on okay. this section. So like levels of training are like, or like I'm doing this eccentric focus and week two, I can go up this much and week two, I can go up this much and concentric. Yeah. Are you seeing different rates of adaptation? You know, I'll give you the most interesting one is, again, I, I'm a huge, huge fan, advocate, believer in overloaded eccentrics. And if, if uh, you've ever seen the Rogue weight releaser, th mm. that is the best one um, I've ever seen. Man, like, yeah, that thing, yeah. it, that design is unbelievable. Too. Yeah, it's really good. I actually got that one too. And I was like, Rogue, good it's, too, man. Well, and <laughs> it's crazy because the, the simplicity of it was there's, there's just that little, that little lip and then it uh, diagonals off and just that yeah. little lip guarantees it'll pop off the bar. Yeah. Um, you know, I was at another school. We had, we had enough weight releasers for every rack and us as coaches, you know, we got our men and, and again, I, I give, if they're listening, there was one coach on staff who could figure it out because he was really good at just dropping into the bottom on everything to make that. But I remember, uh, I'm sitting there. Off. Yeah. I know yeah. What you mean. But I'm sitting there and I'm, if anything's, uh, you know, accentuated eccentric, it wouldn't come off the bar and it's just pulling the bars and it's pulling us backwards and we're just having all these issues with it. So we couldn't even utilize them. Uh, but anyway, since I've been here and just, you know kind of discovering for myself how well designed that rogue weight releaser was oh man that, it just opened up a world of possibilities but here's here's what i found so when we're doing this with the weight releasers and then and then don't let me get off track remind me to come back and let's talk about that gap between the eccentric one at max and the concentric one at max but when we're doing these uh weight releasers i the the first introduction to it what I want to do is I want to do sets of three plus two clusters, you know, so, so the, you know, the series of it, that three plus two, we'll, we'll usually do between three to five sets, depending on who it is, where we're at. Uh, but we'll do up to five sets of a three plus two. So that would be 25 reps. And all we're doing is that first set of three, we'll load 70% of the one rep max on the bar. We'll load 30% of the one rep max on the hook. So you have 100% of your one rep max eccentrically. And then we'll control it down, blow up off the chest, you know, hit our two more reps. I'm, I'm a big believer in the five second rule, um, which if you can control that bar at the exact same speed from lockout midpoint to chest on a five second eccentric, that to me, that, that's, that's going to give you every adaptation you need to overload your eccentrics. Okay. Some people say it's a little bit more. I, I'm not saying there's no value there, but I do think five seconds is is plenty, especially for our population. But we'll do the first rep is gonna be 100% one rep max. We'll take it into two more reps. The weight releasers come off. So there'll be two more reps done at 70%. Rack it, put that hook back on, same thing. 100% on the way down, 70% on the way up. Do a second rep, rack it. And so there's a couple of things that happen there. One, if you've got a good training gauge, your nervous system is gonna be way more prepared for higher intensities than the tissue is. And I think that there's got to be a tissue prep phase for your body to understand, hey, we are handling 100% or more of a one rep max. Just don't blow the wheels off. Just, just live the train another day. Give yourself somewhere to go. Okay. So on week one, the first time anybody does it, it's, it's the first set. You're just going, like, okay, yeah, that's, that's unique. That's different. It's tiring. You get done with the day. A lot of guys will fail. Uh, you know, usually on that last set somewhere, and that's, that's where we'll shut it down. So if they fail on set three, four, five, whenever that is, we'll, we'll shut it down at that point. You get to week two, if you were to do the exact same weight, there's no failure, right? The adaptation is quick, but I like to go up by about two and a half percent on the hooks, not on the bar, because again, we're not trying to overload the concentric. We're not trying to burn out concentric. We're just trying to overload the eccentric. But then when we get to week three, when you talk about adaptation. And usually by week two, there's no fails. You get to week three and guys are, hey, coach, this is easy. Can, can we keep any, I'll let them move it up a little bit. Again, just no, no misreps, uh, rep integrity. But you might go from week one to week two, where you went from 30% of your one rep max split between the hooks. Week two, you're at 32 and a half. 
And then week three, you might be at 40% mm. just because you make this massive jump. And so when you talk about the adaptation, again, I, I can only speak on the experiences I've had with it. Uh, and, and I do have guys with really, really good nervous systems. Um, we recruit at a very high level here at the University of Houston. Um, you know, so that may look different. And I think it's important to know if you're at, you know, a small school where you know, maybe you're more skilled than you are athletic, you know, that adaptation may look a little bit different. Uh, but man, you talk, again, I, I, I'm, I'm blown away by it. Just the adaptation is so quick. And then when we run them through it, excuse me, we run them through it the next time, uh, that's when we really, really try to overload it. So now you're talking about 80% on the bar and 45%. So you're going at 125% of your one rep max. And it might just, again, I love clusters, man. I love clusters for our overloaded eccentrics, but it might be five sets of one plus one. So at the end of the day, we only got 10 reps in, but they were all done at 125% of the one rep max. And you see the exact same thing happening. Week one, you start hitting failure, you know, whatever that is, you know, four or five, set four or five, just go ahead and shut it down. Week two, you go up and wait. There's no, you know, two and a half percent, but there's no failure. And then by week three, you're saying like, man, this kid's working off 140% of his one rep max. So again, just, I think these true overloaded eccentrics are so underutilized. And I think that, you know, we live in a world of athletics where concentric outputs are so rewarded that when you say, hey, let's actually focus on, you know, the other side of that, you know, equation, let's really emphasize the eccentric. Well, now, like I said, going back to that gap, uh, you know, I've, see, I've seen kind of a broad spectrum where I'd say on average, it's about 40% where you're going to be, you know, 140% of your cons, you know, your one rep max is kind of where you're going to be at eccentrically. Um, and that's really, really easy. I mean, you can run it like any other one rep max testing day. Uh, all you're doing though, is you're just doing it with the hooks and, and never, never go crazy heavy on that bar. Just again, it's not about the concentric. And I see a lot of people make that mistake where the hooks are really not that loaded and the bar is too heavy. So if it's a true eccentric day, load the hooks and then just drive fast like you would with any other day with that, you know, with that barbell. Um, but anyway, so I've seen the spectrum and a lot of times it's about 40%. Uh, I've seen some as low as, you know, like 20%. And the one I had heard about this, I never seen it. I actually saw it with a trained strength coach who trained as an athlete, trained as a coach. Uh, it was a 100% difference for her, what she could do eccentrically versus concentrically on the bench press, not on the squat, but on the bench press. And so, you know, so you talk about the big wide spectrum. Well, now you can start saying, well, what are the benefits? So if you're saying, let's say there's only a 20% gap between your eccentric one at max and your concentric one at max. Well, that's a small gap and you're never going to be stronger concentrically than eccentrically. So you don't have a lot of space to push and to work within that 20%. But what if we can say, let's focus on eccentrics and overloading and taking that from 120% to 140%. Well, now you've got a big gap to pull that concentric with it. Whereas let's say you have somebody who maybe they're operating at 150%. Their, their one rep max eccentrically is at 150% of their concentric one rep max. Well, maybe the focus shouldn't be on overloaded eccentrics and maybe the focus really should be on how do we get you better concentrically? And so just knowing that if we have a day that we dedicate to this, we can make that big of a decision. This kid will get their biggest bang for their buck and the adaptation is gonna be really, really fast if we do overloaded eccentrics. But that kid over there, he's already got this crazy, you know, you, know, you talk about guys that are really good um, you know, with speed and they, they can accelerate, but they're not necessarily great bracers, right? Or you have the guys that are, you know, they're real, real shifty. And, you know, they're more shifty than they are fast. Well, they're, they're usually good, you know, breakers and bracers. So those are two different things that you got to take into consideration when training. And to me, the same thing is with this eccentric. Okay. If you got someone who's really, really strong eccentrically, focus on pulling that concentric up with it and training explosively concentrically. Maybe you just haven't trained your body to push that bar so fast that when you get to the point of fatigue, and there's an involuntary slowdown 
well, you know what? You probably still got five more really good reps in the tank after that happens. Mm -hmm. So maybe at this point, let's start training that person. You know, if you want to use like an RPE or something like that, maybe at this point we say, hey, we're going to take you to the point that you're driving as hard as you can drive on all these reps. And as soon as the rep slows down, now we need to get five. Okay. And again, that's just a different strategy you can use because now you're training them to tap into these high threshold motor units, be really, really strong concentrically. And you're just, you're, again, you're just saturating an attribute they don't already have. But you can also say on the flip side, let's go talk about that coach who was 100% stronger eccentrically than concentrically. Well, you know what? Maybe she's just not able to handle enough load because concentrically she's so weak in that press. Now, what if we said, you know what? Maybe there is going to be a lot of value because this person, you know, instead of doing, you know, 65, 75 pounds on the bar for her reps, what if we just go through a whole block, training block? We're going to put a weight release on there. And she's going to have 115 or 120 pounds, 130 pounds in her hands instead of that, you know, 80, 70, whatever we're going to use. Well, that's also going to get you really, really strong because you're introducing a new stimulus and you have to adapt to something different. And so to me, it's just it's just little bits of information that now you got to make a decision of how do we make improvements and is it even worth chasing that adaptation? Yeah. Right. And so to me, this is where this thing gets fun, because there's no right answer per se where this is the one correct way to do it. There, there's always a lot of wrong ways to do things. Mm -hmm. Um, but this is where it gets fun, where if you, if you truly are a master of your craft and you just you, you take pride in what you do, knowing what somebody can do eccentrically versus concentrically opens up another world of training opportunities that if you don't focus on that, it's not available to you. Yeah. So big, 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 you know, kind of rant there. No, but, it's, you know, it's, I think it's important. No, it's unbelievable. Uh, you know, one of the things I was thinking about on this, and you talked about the guys you recruit and the style of play you, you have, you know, have you seen any of these massive improvements in eccentric strength, like 20% and above, correlate specifically to increasing in lean body mass or like any, like any connection there? Okay, so here's what I'm gonna say. I think the most of our guys come in with a really young training age. Okay, so I don't want to take credit for that. Most of these guys did a just the best possible job of picking their parents. Genetics, you know, through the roof. So I don't want to take credit for that. For that. But the other thing, yeah, just, my parents screwed me, man. For God, uh, but whatever. I think, no, whatever. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> no, don't, don't my even dad started, doesn't man. listen to this, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> no, I, I, again, man, I was. Uh, you know, I was, I was a little bit over six foot four. So, I, you know, when I'm standing barefoot, uh, you know, I had a back surgery a little bit ago and it was funny. I hadn't hided myself in a while and I get in again. I'm like, oh man, I'm like six, three and some change now. Oh, what happened? So embarrassing. Man. Oh, so embarrassing awful, man. Man. <laughs> oh, I, I didn't go outside for months. Like, you know, I didn't want anybody to see me. It was shameful. Uh, but oh. no, I, I was, I was always a really tall guy, man. I love the weight room. Um, not even gonna lie, man. I, I was, I started taking creatine when I was like, 11 or 12. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I've been, you know, I've just been getting big and strong forever, but I have really, really short arms, right? I have super short legs. And if I'm sitting down at a dinner table with our athletes, I'm usually the tallest one. I get these super long. Well, that doesn't necessarily, you know, like, that doesn't bode well for being a great athlete. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you have those things. So like credit to them for picking their parents the right way and just, you know, so some guys might look the part, you know, and some people might say like, I would look the part, but when you actually time to compete, you know, just a very average athlete. So you better have an attribute like strength or power to make up for the lack of actual athleticism. right? Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, so going back to that question, have you seen these, you know, body mass improvements, um, you know, great genetics, all these things. But then the other one is if you've never trained hard and we feed our guys three times a day. Okay? And, and then on top of feeding them, we have a 24 seven fueling station within our locker room. Uh, I mean, yes, I've seen phenomenal improvements in our body comp and, and, and the lean, you know, muscle, you know the, the muscle mass we're putting on that lean tissue. Uh, but I think if you were to go to someone else that even train more lackluster than I, you know, I think we train at a high level. Um, but even if you go someone trains a little more lackluster and you started feeding them the way we feed them and you have the same genetics we have, I think you're still going to see guys that would make tremendous improvements. So I don't want to oversell that. Like we've got some secret formula or this, that, the other, that we're operating with at UH. Um, but yeah, I mean, 
you know, it's crazy. We, we had a kid transfer in who he was a fifth year guy, you know, with COVID, they gave everybody one extra year of eligibility. They were trying, you know, trying to essentially let the kids know at the beginning of the year, look, if this thing shuts down again, you don't need a red shirt. You're going to get the extra year of eligibility because there was a lot of concern. Kids didn't want to play that year out of concern. It would shut down. They'd lose their, their year. Um, so they all got an extra year of eligibility. We brought a kid in from a quote unquote low major school. Again, anybody listening who's not aware of that, it's just a, you know, kind of an underfunded, you know, not high resource university. Uh, and really all you do is kids come in, they, they get a scholarship and, and there's just not a lot of resources to support them in their athletic endeavors outside of having the coaches and the courts to play on. And so we brought in a kid who's a fifth year guy who came in at six foot five and 170 pounds. Just again, he turned sideways and, and he disappeared on it, right? Like you just couldn't see him. But within the first, I believe it was eight weeks, I mean, he put on 21 pounds. And so as we're looking at his body fat, the body fat, which I'll be the first one to say, I am the worst at doing calipers. So I got to use, I mean, I'm just, I'm just bad at it, man. I'm, I'm, it is what it is. To be honest, we, like that's why we use yeah. ultrasound at our facilities. Cause I don't want to put yeah. pressure on coaches on that. So like I can get every site. We don't do the full 12 site. We do a seven site, but I can get every site. Yeah. And I know from me to you, to every one of our staff, like we came into that same problem too. It's like it's such a skill thing, man. So oh, ultrasound. Well, so it's a nice little, nice little turnaround for us. If, if I do the seven sight on the same guy, I'm going to get different numbers. If I do it day by day by day, I mean, I'm just, it just, it is, you know, your strengths, know your weaknesses, man. I'm just, it's, I just am not super skillful at that, but we still have other ways to go about doing our body comp. So the one kid who was at 170, uh, put on 21 pounds over those eight weeks, uh, his, his body fat percentage stayed the same. So you're looking at that and you're saying, okay, there's, there's some, there's some good things happening. But he's a kid that was already trained and all the credit in the world, you know, to his former strength staff, man, he was well, well trained. He was just kind of underfed. Okay. Right. Yeah. And so it was one of those. So sometimes you got to look at it and really like, I love to take credit and say, man, this kid did this, this kid did that. And like, I'm, you know, it was a program we put out, but there's, there's always so many more variables going into it. Um, but yeah, will freshmen come in, you know, put on 20 pounds their first year um, just because, they're elite genetics. They're eating really well and they're training really well. So yeah, I, I probably don't have a way to separate it out and say, if we'd have done this, it would have only been this percent. This would have been this, but I will say kind of holistically everything going together. Uh, you know, man, it, it's been working really well for us. Yeah. So I got one more question because, uh, yeah. you know, this is, uh, it's been a really cool conversation and you mentioned Mike Mentor before and, you know, one of the things that I think when you read some of the old hit stuff with Arthur Jones, Mentor, Darden, um, Kim Wood, all these guys, you know, they talk about you know, the rep is so, it's such an untapped resource from you're leaving so much in the tank, eccentrically and isometrically, right? The, the, that, that organization of like strongest to weakest, that we're only doing something that's concentrically limited and we're leaving so much on the table. Would you say now, and I'm basing this question off of what you described with the rate, weight release hooks, is that the value you're looking at from a, I got the most from that rep or that set and rep scheme is predicated off that I stress eccentric and isometric and then try to push the bar as concentrically fast as possible, or is they still trying to push to some sort of concentric threshold and try to get as much at each one of those phases of the contraction, or is that... Is that something that just like it's dependent upon the day or the time of year? Yes. <laughs> awesome. Right. Done. No, no, let, let, Done. No, I'm going to do this. <laughs> awesome. So, <laughs> no, okay. So I think if, if the way I look at training as well, it, it's still skill development. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can utilize, let's not, let, like, let's look at isometrics, for example. Okay. If you want to say, you know, like we would all agree, you know, strength is very joint angle specific. And if, if you're peaking, you should probably be doing things that resemble what you're trying to peak in from joint angles. Uh, you know, and that's where like an overcoming isometric uh, would be really, really cool um, to utilize at that point. Say, hey, we're, we're going to work through X number of reps. Uh, you know, maybe it's more of like that, uh, you know, isodynamic um style of training but we're going to work through some reps and then we're going to drive as hard as we can into the bar overcoming isometric 
just trying to create as much force as possible, as much tension as possible. We're just trying to get strong in this specific joint angle where the bar is not moving. Okay, that's really cool. And that, that correlates well to performance. But what if you're trying to teach a kid how to train well? And you can tell that, hey, okay, take a guy like me, short arms. You, you, I'm probably, if I'm trying to train my back, there's not going to be a ton of range of motion if I'm doing, doing a row straight ahead or if I'm doing a bench press, you know, just, you know, a flat press. There's not a lot of range there and it's probably going to be super tricep dominant on a press. Um, you know, it's probably going to be pretty bicep dominant on a, uh, you know, a pull. So I'm going to say, let's do a, a neutral grip, high angle cable stack lap pull down. And what I want to do is I want you to pause at the midpoint. And during this pause, I want you to contract. And I might go up and literally touch where I want him to feel this. And you're going to hold this for 10 seconds before you go with your reps. Okay. So that would be, you know, that pre-exhaust, you know, that, you know, saddle dynamic, whatever you want to call it. But now we're using an isometric to teach. So if I'm sitting here saying, hold this for 10 seconds in week one. And then we're going to take it through our reps. Every rep is going to be on, you know, a, a 2X, you know, two tempo, whatever you want to do. So it's still going to be a good technically sound rep, but I want to start with the, with an isometric. Well, now they're feeling, oh, okay. Short arm guy who'd always done rows or lat pull downs a certain way, probably wasn't getting the most out of it. All we did was we just kind of changed the angle of the exercise. And we're saying, now we're going to teach you. But now what you can do is say, hey, week two, progressive overload, because we're still tracking that time under tension, instead of doing a 10 second, what if we use the exact same weight, we do the same reps, we have the same time under tension, except for we add five seconds to time under tension by adding five seconds to that initial isometric, you know, yielding isometric contraction. Well, now... Mr. Basketball, man, that doesn't necessarily love lifting weights. I'm not even asking you to go up and wait. I'm just asking you to hold this for an extra five seconds and do the same thing you did last week. Okay, so now you can utilize time under tension as a loading parameter. You can also say hey, we're using isometrics as a teaching tool. Okay, or what if it's uh, what if it's the other one? What if it's somebody with really really long arms that you got such a huge range that maybe if we're in a uh, you know, accumulation phase, we want to work on some of those weak points. So we probably better overload those triceps a little bit more. So maybe we're doing some floor pressing and we just want everything to be concentrically based, right? So we're going to dumbbells in your hands. We're going to lay you on the ground. You're going to come to a dead stop. And all I want you to do is build tension and then explode off the floor. Okay. So now you can utilize these different, you know, contraction types to teach people how to train. And again, it's, is there one specific thing that we're trying to chase? You know, not necessarily, but there's a few things we're, we're always trying to look, you know, like you said, just bar speed, okay? People lose sight of how important that is, okay? Because again, once you hit that involuntary deceleration of the bar or the dumbbell, but you put the same amount of effort trying to move it as fast. Well, now you are tapping into those high threshold motor units and you're recruiting more and more and more. And that's where that strength and that, that hypertrophy is going to come from. And that's going to be able to saturate an attribute of being explosive, saturate an attribute of getting big and having more mass that now when we go at monster and we're double teaming into paint, well, I, I'd rather play against a guy who's 220 than play against a guy who's 235. Sometimes it just really is that simple, you know, and, and it's funny, you know, it's like we do a lot of the before and after photos. Um, I, I think that's just an unbelievable tool because you, you're around these guys so much. And sometimes you do forget like, Oh man, this guy's really done a good job. So having that before and that after photo, a lot of times can, you know, it helps with the coaches so they can like, Oh yeah, I forgot. This is what we started at. It helps with the players. They love posting that stuff. You know, they all got, family, friends, you know, girlfriends, whatever it is that, you know, they're proud of their work. Um, but again, I think that's kind of where that before and after photo stuff comes in is really well, because just looking at those two, you can look at the head coach and say, Hey, which one of these two do you want on your team? Cause again, it's not like he put on 20 pounds and he forgot how to play above the rim. It's not like he put on 20 pounds and he forgot how to pass the ball. He's just a, a, a bigger you know, stronger, fitter, faster version of himself. 
which is how we play big, strong fit, you know, all these things that we're trying to do. So, you know, again, so again, sorry, I, I know I'm kind of veering off yeah, there, but coming right. back to the original question, it, it just comes down to what are you trying to do? Well, what does a kid need? And I'm just a big believer in teaching and I want to teach you how to train well. And that's where, again, just now we, we separated days and just using an isometric can be a great teaching tool. So you're, you're, you're getting, you know, two birds, one stone, you're getting good training. You know, we talked about going from 10 seconds to 15 seconds, but maybe week three, it's a 20 second. But you've done it with the same weight where now you're saying, hey, in week one, you hit that involuntary, you know, deceleration of bar speed. You were still fighting. You're still doing it. You're still going to get that strength. But now we're doing it with more time under tension. Or you could just say, hey, we're going to keep the time under tension the same and we're just going to keep going up in weight. Yeah. Right. So now you can objectively kind of quantify your overload, you know, strategies. And so, again, I, I like it from a teaching standpoint. And I do think that it's part of the reason I I really enjoy working for my head coach is he, he's just, he's like a pedagogy guy. He is, he is just such a guy of, of you know, I'm going to teach you and I'm going to bring up your basketball IQ because the better you get at that basketball IQ and then you play really, really hard. Well, okay. Well, you know, well, what are we leaving on the table there? So yeah, yeah again, I, I wish I had a better maybe answer for you. But no, just, no, no. To be honest, you know, I think that's the, that's, that's the answer I was looking for. It's this idea that I'm trying to leverage whatever it is to get the job done and whatever my tools are. And sometimes it's simple as just how we do something, right? Like, you yeah. know, I mean, a lot of us can't afford weight release folks. Maybe we could, but like where we can't get an Atlantis pendulum squat or something like that, right? Like, yeah. but I can make the most out of doing a dumbbell hack squat, right? Like I can do that really well. And if a person doesn't know how to contract his quads, where do I pause them? Where do I go slow? And where do I, where do I stop? And then you let the magic happen. Um, so I just want to say thank you for this. This was like, honestly, beyond like all expectations. This is awesome. So I really appreciate it. Um, any place you want people to go? Do you like uh, people to find you? My small but loyal fan base here, um, finding Alan Bishop. Um, where would you want people to find you? And uh, how could they get to know you, uh, you a little bit more? Yeah, uh, you know, if, if you want to find me, I, you know, I am pretty active on both Twitter and Instagram and it's coach Alan Bishop. So A L A N uh, Bishop. So coach Alan Bishop. And then, you know, I'm, I'm, I just want to touch on something you said, because it's, it's a paradigm shift that I had when I was at Utah state and you were saying, Hey, maybe you can't afford this, or maybe, you know, you can't afford that. I, I want to always put out a challenge because it is something that I think there's a time and a place to say, you know, hey, I work at University of X, Y, and Z. They've got all the money and resources in the world. I'm not going to use my personal computer and my personal cell phone and my personal car. You know, maybe, maybe that's a time and a place for that. But if you're going to say, I'm not going to invest into myself because I can't afford it, I get that. And again, I told you earlier, man, I was making peanuts early in my career. And, and honestly, I, I was making peanuts again at Arlington, you know, if you, you know, you, you live in an expensive Metroplex, you're not making money. I'm not making very much. Honestly, even when I took that Utah state job, this wasn't a high paying job. Uh, but again, credit to Dave, credit to Charles Pollock. I, I think of all the things Charles did, my biggest takeaway was that, that learn more to earn more, the invest in yourself. And it's one of the things that I, I do struggle I'm, I'm, I'm empathetic about it. I understand money's, you know, not growing on trees and it's not raining hundred dollar bills outside. But if you truly think, man, if I just had $200 to invest into a pair of weight releasers, that would make a tremendous difference. And now I can actually, you know, if you're on a private site, well, you better be charging more for your services because you're providing a better service. Yeah. So you've invested into yourself so pass that on and, 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 and earn more because of it. Or if you're in the collegiate setting, you know, and again, I, I don't want to talk about high school. I don't want to talk about pros. I, I, I've not been on those, you know, sides of the world to even pretend like I have a good opinion. Um, but if you're in the collegiate setting and you're sitting here saying, hey, I really think that if I could just figure out a few more things about nutrition, that that would be the X factor. We, you know, we have a better product out of the weight room. We get better results out of our players. I just don't know what to do or where to start. Well, if you're not willing to invest in yourself because of money, then why would anybody else invest in you? Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. Oh, and, yeah. and, and I'm not even talking about the school you're at. Yeah, I get it. You know, Southern Utah didn't have the money to give me a thousand dollars to go take a course. I get that. But Southern Utah is also not going to invest more into my salary. Yeah. So if I want to have that potential to earn more because I'm providing a better service and X, Y, Z, well, I'm going to invest into myself because I want somebody else to invest into me at the next stop. So again, I'm, I'm not telling you to go, you know, no, no, put yourself right, in a poorhouse, but it's the right message. Invest in yourself. Though. Like, yeah. shoot, no doubt. Like, I mean, I, I think a lot of people at a certain point have to make that decision of how good they really want to be. And when you start to, I guess, go cheap in certain areas, you know, you're going to potentially limit your overall worth over time. And I think as we start to break down the difference between people who really ultimately get what they want are the ones that are probably more willing to go make that sacrifice. And yeah, it yeah. might mean I'm going to have to, you know, probably have some lower cost meals. I'm not buying grass fed Wapiti from, from the Wapiti river in Montreal, as Charles would try to recommend, but you know, I can do, I can do something, you know, like I can eat something. Yeah. But I'm definitely going to do the right things in my pursuit of understanding and growing. And I think that was always my edge, relatively speaking, to everyone else I've ever worked with or, and why I was able to get to a certain point professionally. And it's, it wasn't hard. It wasn't complicated. Like I told multiple people this, I probably spent over a hundred thousand dollars in my education between, between secondary education and college and master's degrees. And then just going out there, courses, books and resources galore, right? Like yeah. it wasn't free to go see Charles at Utah state, but me and Will <laughs> both looked at ourselves like, I don't know if this is an opportunity we'll get too often. And Dave was like, Hey, we need this much. Like, no problem. We'll be there, man. Like, you know, like I, it was, it was on the cheap too. Like you go to see Charles, like that's probably the best deal you're ever going to get. And it definitely wasn't cheap, you know? Um, mm. But you don't golf at that. You go for it. Cause that's, that's how you become better. Um, so, I mean, you're right. Absolutely. So, um, well, one, thank you again for being on here. Uh, this was awesome. And I really appreciate the insight and just, just the candor on everything that like got you to this point, man. And just, you can see the stuff that happened while you're at where you're at and it wasn't an accident. You didn't get lucky. It wasn't nepotism. It wasn't anything other than I did a lot of really good things and I worked really hard and I took and made a lot of sacrifices and now you're in the back end, much like you're talking about with your athletes. So thank you for all that, man. That was, it was really awesome. Um, so um, that, that will do it, man. So thank you. And uh, we'll see you uh, hopefully again here soon, man. For sure, man. Really, uh, really fun catching up and having a conversation, man. Thanks for inviting me on. Absolutely.